So, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's welcome uh, Vince Hemmingson uh, to the first ever uh, Lempa Zoom. And uh, just to give you guys a quick little thing, Lempa was launched last year. Uh, matter of fact, I built the website during the Passover break, and uh, Lempa had a great start, and it and it failed. It just went right off a cliff. Uh, we uh, we lost our target uh, to do a conference in New York City, which was quite expensive, and uh, the whole project kind of got put onto a shelf. And uh, after playing with Zoom in our time of of COVID, I realized that wow, this may be the perfect thing because. The original plan called for bringing in photographers from Vancouver, from Los Angeles, and uh, from uh, Arizona, and it, it, it just is, this is great. Zoom, we're I, we're doing this for fifteen dollars a month, so it's a it's a lovely thing. Uh, we're joined here today to go through ten stories and ten photographs with Vince Hemmingson, who is one of the first uh, Lempa influencers. And uh, by the way, Lempa is the Light Eros Muse Photography Arts, and our mission is is to elevate the genre of erotica fetish fine art nude, get it out of the bathroom and up into the living rooms and the dining rooms. Uh, because, uh, you know, we grew up in this prudish society and uh, it's really reverberated deep into the society. And, and what we do in erotica, fine art nudes, uh, fetish photography is we celebrate uh, the form, which uh, should, be, should be hanging right over uh, dining room tables across the world. Uh, so we're working to bring that nice and strong. Um, within those genres, there are subsets of the genres. And I've identified one as the fine art nude in the landscape. And uh, I want to tell you guys a little about uh, Vince Hemmingson, who uh, I uh, talk a little bit down the road how I discovered Vince, but uh, photographer Vince Hemmingson is a world traveler, screenwriter, best-selling author, filmmaker, and the creator of one of the internet's largest, most popular, and critically acclaimed related websites to tattoos and body art. And that is vanishingtattoo.com which is visited by 20 million visitors every year and growing. And uh, this was uh, a series of books that, uh, books and projects that Vince had done. Uh, Vince brings over 30 years of uh, experience in photography to the table. Uh, Vince has studied with Ralph Gibson, Greg Gorman, which I want to say Greg Gorman, we have a, an original Greg Gorman print hanging up there in the back. That's uh, the legendary Jody Arias. Uh, he's a, uh, Studied with Joe McNally, Freeman Patterson, Tom Hogan, and uh, a very good friend of a number of us, Peter Hurley. And uh, also, uh, you are the uh, the Vancouver uh, first headshot photographer for Peter Hurley headshot crew in Vancouver. Uh, you've been published in Volo Blur. Uh, you've done slide lock presentations across the country. Casey Kelbell, we know him. Uh, your tattoo project and body art image was uh, published in 2012 by Schiffer. Uh, this is a, a beautiful book on on uh, tattoo photography. Uh, Vince was publishing his work online and somehow I got connected and started seeing his work online and fell in love with this guy who did this uh, nude in the landscape so well. And you know, nude in the landscape is a, a very particular talent uh, because it's hard to pull off. Uh, landscapes are fickle, weather's fickle, models are fickle. And uh, I saw this work that Vince did with a lot of models and uh, really caught my attention. Execution was fabulous. As I got to know the man a little bit more, I started to see his, uh, his really his acumen. And I just wanna share some photographs that sum up, uh, sum up our friend. Hold on a second there. And okay. So uh, Vince is a man of many talents and over 30 years, we're seeing a uh, broad range of work uh, step out. Uh, this is some uh, beautiful landscape work um, that really uh, landscape and wildlife work uh, that is uh, just shows uh, an eye for composition, technical acumen, and I certainly could mention a few names, uh, wildlife photographers, that this is reminiscent of and could easily uh, be mistaken for. But I think that's just a reflection of the quality. Uh, this was his tattoo work from Vanishing Art. And one thing about Vince that does really well is that, uh, personally, uh, tattoos are an entire form of art all to itself. Uh, so when you're photographing tattoos, it's almost like you're doing copy artwork. Um, However, the way Vince does it is a, it's a study, it's a beautiful portrait, and it really gets inside of people. Um, I'm attracted to Vince's work because he likes to work outside the box. Uh, obviously has a influence uh, from, uh, uh, from our, our New Yorker, um, oh my God, sorry, I'm guessing on his name, uh, 
Come on, Vince, who's, who's our, our Maplethorpe, excuse me, Maplethorpe, a little bit of influence from Maplethorpe, which is a, a great uh, compliment in itself. Uh, also a, a mastery in terms of execution. Um, I'm gonna have to ask Vincent later on when he tells the story about this photograph, if this photograph is uh, a pinhole or not. You can shake your head, yes or no, if it's a pinhole. No pinhole? Okay, it has a pinhole feel to it. Um, form, light, shape, these are all the tools that Vince knows very well. And the compositional elements, I'm, I hate to say I'm a, a composition Nazi, but I think within the Lempo world, I can say that. And uh, composition, I love good composition. It, it makes me feel good. It makes my head feel good when I look at images that are well composed. And certainly Vincent, uh, Vince has the, this down to a T, um, using lines, shapes. Uh, but then his work starts to emerge and he gets braver in his old age and he starts to work with many models. And when you're working with many models, uh, it complicates and changes everything. Uh, and I'd like to think that Vince, when you shot this, this was a, you emerged from the ocean along with the swimmers. And it's a, uh, a testimony to perfect composition, the positive and negative space, light, shadow, everything. I gotta, I gotta work on getting a print from you. Uh, and then this one really caught my eye on the internet. And again, it's the excellent use of the of black and white. Uh, there's texture, there's a story. Uh, goddess rising and then tree of life is what really got me and, and these are all the images that uh, that Vince was uh, really distilled took him about 10 hours to pick 10 photographs from his life's work to uh, throw up here and uh, we're gonna just say hello to Vince for a second and, and then we're gonna continue with this part of the presentation um, hold on a second there Swing back Get out of the full screen and hold on. <laughs> and a little technical difficulty there. I am sorry. Hold on a second. Back to meeting. Not me. <laughs> it's this mouse pad. Okay, there we are. And back to meeting. Hello. <laughs> I've lost my window. Okay. I hope I don't crash it. Hold on, guys. I apologize. Okay. Um, that share. Ah, here we go. Okay. No. Okay, we're going to stick to pictures. Okay. Uh, Vince, you are the star of the show anyway. So, um, I want to go back to saying uh, welcome to this and um, can you uh, just tell us quickly a little bit about uh, what you've been up to? Um, well, I haven't shot outside now in five weeks since the, uh, I mean, as photographers, we're very person to person and it's impossible to uh, safely distance and self-isolate. So the last five weeks, um, I've actually started, uh, I had a client that I had to cancel a boudoir photo shoot coming up for her anniversary and she was desperate to, for her lovely husband who had enjoyed the photographs from our previous photo shoots. So I did uh, FaceTime on WhatsApp and uh, directed her in a selfie session and now I've done, I think I'm up to seven of those. Interesting, virtual photo shoots. Virtual, virtual photo shoots. It's actually an excellent exercise in Zen patience and uh, trying to make your directions be as simple and easy to follow as possible. So um, interesting note for, for Charles Chesler there. I, I, I could see him uh, giving a, a, a shout out to you later on to find out a little bit more about that. Um, I just want to also go into uh, Vince. We're very fortunate to have you with us. and I. I know obviously we're living in the time of COVID, but you, you were recently, you fell ill and uh, you, you are, you're recovering and you recovered really well. Um, watching that unfold on social media was, was very hard uh, touching. Um, Vince, you, uh, you know, within fortune, uh, you had your illness right before all this, the shit, and, which is quite lucky. Uh, so it's unlucky that you did, uh, you did fall ill, but it's lucky that it, you did at the time that you did. Uh, so 
you know, we're very fortunate, lucky to have you with us. So thank you for, for getting better. Yeah. The, 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 the winter spring of 2019-2020 uh, has been, uh, been a fascinating one, oh. to say the So, you know, well done. Um, let's talk about, uh, let's, so these are 10 handpicked photographs that you chose and you're, um, and let's hear the story behind these photographs. Give us the anecdotes. Would love to. Are you going to show me the photographs? There so we go. <laughs> it, uh, this is my tattoo Gothic family. And um, it was a toss up between using either this photograph or the photograph of Leia Young in the top 10. I chose Leia because she ended up being picked by the um, publisher and my art director as the cover of the book. But I love this photograph. And they're with their lovely daughter, Hannah. And I did my light setup. And um, I always like to have, when I do portraits, I always like to have an assistant. I like my assistant before I shoot my uh, uh, subject. In this case, Hannah was wiggling and um, the studio had a cement floor. She wiggled out of Six's arms. So I shot only 12 frames for this portrait session and this is frame number nine. So if I had been having to adjust the lights or the setup, if I hadn't been perfectly ready for to have them step into frame, right from shot one, I never would have got this shot. So it's one of my favorite shots and I got it in less than a typical roll of film. Well done, well done. Well, you were prepared. Preparation is uh, the, the inspiration and... Perspiration, 99%. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, wildlife there. <laughs> wildlife, so this is, I love this because this is in the Okavanga Delta in Botswana, and it's uh, late August, perhaps early September. Anyway, we were going, we weren't even shooting wildlife. We were in a Zodiac, and it was myself and uh, two other photographers and our guide. And as we came around the corner, this uh, bull elephant was crossing the, the the channel and all those firms in the background are actually papyrus and they're about 12 feet high. And we started, he, he startled us and we startled him. And he started to run away and then he kind of realized, hey, I'm a bull elephant, I don't run away from anybody. So he charged us. So we had the Zodiac in full reverse and our guide was saying, Vince, stay at the front, hold the nose down, otherwise you wouldn't have been able to steer the Zodiac. And I actually never stopped taking pictures the entire time. So I like to think that's my National Geographic uh, experience coming for and just never stop taking pictures. I can see a trend happening here. You, <laughs> your, uh, your trend is that you're prepared and you don't flinch in the face of a, of a rough photograph. Yeah, I, well before every shoot, um, and this was a tip that I picked up from Helmut Newton where he, before every photo shoot, would lie on a couch, put a, something over his eyes and he would just think about what he was going to do for 30 minutes before every shoot so before every shoot that i go to i go to the shoot with a couple of ideas in mind that what i want to do and i find that because i'm a bit of an obsessive compulsive and i have anxiety so what i do is if i know that i'm going to do a specific shot that i get them and then that frees me up to relax and see what else can come out of the shoot. Mm. And oftentimes, as in the case of uh, Six and Tara and Hannah, that prior preparation meant that I got a shot that otherwise I probably never would have gotten. Mm. You know, I also heard a story from Helmut Newton. Uh, he went to photograph Nick Cage, Nick Cage's peak of his career. This was like late 80s. And uh, he goes to Nick's house and Nick says, oh, I got a new Ferrari. So they, they go around, they open up the garage door, and there's the Ferrari. And you know the technique where you place your subject in a doorway or in a lintel, and the light just kind of cascades down on top of them, and the background gets dark? So Helmut says, can you lean on the hood? So Nick puts his foot up on the, on the, 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 on the bumper, leans back, kind of gives a look, 
Helmet whips out a Leica, makes one exposure, says, I got it. Let's get a drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, when know your equipment. <laughs> you got it. Okay, hello. this is your last wildlife, then we're going to get into the uh, a little bit of, of your new trademark. But what's up with the uh, with the spotted uh, spots? Um, well, I think it's, I, I put this one in color. It's a beautiful shot in black and white, and it's part of my Portrait of Africa series. But uh, this was me actually on uh, Tom Hogan's, uh, one of his wildlife um trips one of his uh safari workshops to uh south africa and we had a guy i was fortunate to be with uh and uh rob uh two other wonderful photographers and our guide said to us you know i've seen there was a, a heavily pregnant female leopard i guess if she's pregnant she had to be female uh leopard in the vicinity and I haven't seen her for a few days, but I know what I think is probably her den. Would you be willing to wait and see what happens? So we waited a few days where we sat there not getting anything and being in Africa and spending a fair amount of money to be on a, a wildlife safari, but all of us knowing that the chance to see a female leopard with a brand new kitten was a pretty amazing shot if we ever got it. And everybody was patient enough. So on the third day we were rewarded and I'm sitting there 80 feet away with my 400 F4 and got this shot. And that's about six o'clock in the morning, just after the sun has come up. And it was just, uh, it was an incredibly rewarding experience, an amazing shot. And it was a reward for being patient. Sometimes you just have to wait. So that's a beautiful shot, slightly different uh, than your normal wildlife. The uh that that curve you've got a beautiful curve going on a little spiral so it's yeah quite quite nice okay let's uh i love this one let's yes tell us about I, it <laughs> i am from alstrom so i uh, this uh model is emily and i've shot with emily probably a couple of dozen times um and this root ball um she's actually about 14 feet off the ground there and i go i i couldn't figure out how to use it and she said and then we were talking i go yeah wouldn't it be amazing if someone could be in the middle of that and then she turned to me and she goes i think i could do that and um i have found that uh my subjects and my models invariably make me look good and um I like to go to a shoot with a couple of ideas in mind, but then um, the best, a great shoot is always for me, a collaboration. And the nude in the landscape um, wouldn't be what it is and what it's developed into um, without the incredible amount of collaboration and feedback and creative ideas that I get from my creative partners. Was the, um, did you have this location very specifically uh, mapped out and uh, how did she climb up into that position nude? Um, she is very athletic and uh, I was actually kind of terrified because it seemed to me that it would be an impossible thing to do. I would never have asked her to do it. I just said, wouldn't it be amazing if you could get a picture of someone in that? And she turned to me and she goes, I think I could do that. So it took her about 25 years to work her way in amongst all the roots and get in position. And this is another example of every time I shoot on a couple of local beaches where one's allowed to be, um, it's clothing optional beaches. And every time there's a big storm, uh, you never know what mother nature is going to provide you for a prop. Uh, I had never seen this root ball before. It just appeared one day. Um, and it, it's just kind of that experience of always looking, trying to see, and Emily and I saw something at the same time together and created what is, has become one of my favorite photographs. And you call that the maelstrom? That's the eye of the maelstrom. The eye of the maelstrom. Love it. Love it, Vince. Okay, so that's for something totally different. I'm very curious the story behind this photograph. 
This um, story is, uh, I like to carry a camera with me everywhere. So 20 years ago, when you carried a camera with you everywhere, you were considered a bit of an author. And uh, I always liked Fuji's little pocket cameras because you know, they could fit in your pocket and you could always get a great photograph. So this is my favorite Mexican restaurant um, burning down a block from my house. And because I had my camera with me, um, I, I love this photograph. I won an award with it. Um, according to Aperture, it's one of their most favorited and liked photographs. Gets lots of traffic. Um, it's in the uh, Firefighters Museum here in Vancouver. And they use it on their Facebook page. Awesome. And this, this is the... I was walking to the Starbucks down the block from the restaurant and uh this is a ab completely accidental photograph but i'm a photographer my i take i create images i have a camera on me okay so before we move on to the next slide you've got your camera and you want to make a quick run and you got your iphone but your camera is going to give you a big bulge in your pocket and doesn't fit in your pocket and you got to slip it over your shoulder or you got to put it over you got to you got to deal with a camera but you got this this thing just happens to always be with you because that's the new normal you have to have your phone are you taking less photographs with a more serious camera on a running gun like this uh, well i'm shooting with a, a d850 and a d810 and I'm using prime lenses, and I like a lot of compression, so I'm using a 70 to 200. So it's a big <laughs> camera package. It's big. Um, and I, I'll be honest, the, the, the nowadays, the, it's incredible the images that you can get out of a smartphone. Yeah. But I still like to carry a camera with me in a backpack. I don't use a camera bag. I just carry my camera and two lenses in a backpack with me just about everywhere I go. All right, let's get on to the next photograph, which is uh, what I mistakenly thought was a, a pinhole photograph. But uh, I love this. No, it's it my uh, D810 with the uh, 14 to 24, and it was shot at 60 millimeters. And the camera's actually on the log. This is an interesting story because this is a model that I had never worked before and I didn't know. And she was a nursing student and she lived in Victoria, which is a hundred miles away from Vancouver and a ferry ride. So she had come to Vancouver to work with uh, a couple of different photographers and a friend, a photographer uh, who was a good friend of mine who unfortunately passed away uh, brain cancer, uh, Michael Cordier. Uh, he recommended that I work with her because he really liked her look and I did as well. And but she was doing something called couchsurfer.com. So she had, was surfing on a couch with, uh, uh, in a person whose house she didn't feel comfortable in. So at two o'clock in the morning, she left the house and went to an all night Tim Hortons coffee shop and spent all night pacing back and forth, drinking coffee, waiting for me to pick her up at 6.30 in the morning. So when I picked her up, she was, vibrating from anxiety and caffeine. So when we got to the location to shoot, I actually couldn't get her to stop moving. So my solution to that, this at the end of the log is actually about six feet off the ground. So I sent her out to pose on the end of the log and she had no choice but to sit on the log and not move. And this was one of my, still is one of my favorite photographs. But it was just trying to figure out a way to how do I get a shot with a model who's going through a thing as, because we're all people, we're all, we're all just people. And um, I'd even asked her if I said, I'll, listen, I'll pay you for the shoot and we can shoot another time. I'll take you to the ferry so you can go home. Cause I was her last her last photo shoot but she goes no i i want to do this and i got to pay the rent and, I, and so we went ahead with the shoot and me sticking her out on this log created uh one of my favorite photographs 
you use the environment. Yeah. Okay, this is a little different of a photograph, but uh, one that uh, sort of launched one of your careers. Yeah, this is a Iban headhunter uh, by the name of Jen Tan, and this is the, in the long, long house on the Scrong River in Sarawak, Borneo. And I was on a recce trip for a National Geographic International documentary and for the uh, pilot episode of The Vanishing Tattoo. And I shot this with my slide film, uh, Nikon F3. I don't remember what lens it was. And uh, it was just, you know, the ambient light. And I, I, I shot it just for research and to make, make it as part of our documentary uh, film proposal to submit to distributors and, uh, you know, uh, TV channels around the world, etc. And rather than printing up a lot of expensive uh, color photocopied uh, brochures, proposals, uh, back in 96, we created uh, a website for uh, the documentary film called The Vanishing Tattoo. And we put these photographs up on the website. I got contacted by a publisher of um, textbooks. And this photograph was uh, used for various cultural anthropology and sociology texts. And I got paid so much money for the use of this photograph over the next 10 years that I thought, my God, I should go, go from being a struggling documentary filmmaker maker to having a career as a stock photographer. I had no idea what was about to happen in terms of the transition from analog to digital photography. But at the idea, I thought this was gonna be a great new career for me. I, uh, I know many photographers over the years that rode that wave and I, I, I heard their lamentations for many years <laughs> as that wave evaporated around them. But, uh, Why would you let someone use your photograph for 15 cents? You know, that goes back to uh, one time, <laughs> evidently, there was, a, there was a DJ and there was a band who, who DJed and played music for free at a bar. And they ruined it for all the other DJs and bands out there. But, um, you know, it, it, it was a great model and it dried up. And being here in New York City, I've realized that there's, there's really two, two types of photographers. Uh, there were photographers that they enjoyed all this money of the 80s and the 90s were coming in and they invested it and they were responsible. And then there's the ones that uh, put it up their nose and lived a really wild life at a posse through elaborate parties. And um, they don't have anything to show from those, uh, those glory days of photography, uh, the stock market, stock photography. Uh, okay, so, um, so jumping on to this one, we, we got a is the transition. This photograph made me decide I want. I think I want to be a, a photographer. It took a headhunter to do it. it. Took a headhunter, and he actually tattooed me two years later. So, was that a uh, a, a style? How, did, how what type of uh, ink uh, was it? A tapping bamboo tap, or was it? That was that. Yes, they uh, attached uh, a bunch of sewing needles to the end of a stick, and then they hit it with another stick, aptly called the hammer stick. And five and a half hour later, I had two traditional Iban tattoos. It was a very, it was a very long day. That's pretty cool, but a, a day well worth it. Cheers. That's a no pain, no gain. You got a exactly that's a great story for a tattoo. Okay. <laughs> Uh, moving on to the next one. Hold on. There we go. Now this is uh, this was one of the images that really got me into you. That was a, this was the beacon. Tell us about it. Yeah. So this image is uh, the goddess tree, and a few years previously, I had um, had a model who was into something called acro yoga which I had no idea what it was. So it was people who did yoga, but they did yoga with a bunch of people balancing together. And it was sort of like gymnastics and gymnasts and yoga, yogis all together. And they were making all these interesting poses. And my model suggested that um, she wanted to do a nude acro yogi. So we shot that. And then I had this uh, 
house that I was renovating at the time and we shot and one of the models there showed up and she had never shot, she had never done a nude shoot before in her life. And Catherine just looked at all these uh, women who were comfortable in their bodies and thought, well, I'd like to be able to do that. And she joined in. And then afterwards I said, I'd love to photograph you for another series I'm doing called The Nude in the Landscape. And I said, I'd always wanted to shoot a group of women together because that's part of the human experience. We're social animals. And, I, and The Nude in the Landscape after in Africa, I was part of my concept for shooting The Nude in the Landscape was almost to photograph my subjects as if they were wild animals unobserved by me, the, the photographer. So Catherine goes, well, I know a bunch of people. And uh, this was, this photo shoot was the genesis of all the subsequent groups that came out. Yes. Catherine was so central to a group of bathers coming out of the water. And that was shot um, the year before. So Catherine is another one of those models like Emily and Cecilia and Olivia would they actually were the genesis for an idea that took my body of work in a new direction. So I, so, and I also want to let our viewers know that you have a beautiful article on the LEMPA website uh, underneath the, uh, the, the article section on how to work with multiple models in a photo shoot. And I, I think that, that you have some really good advice that you were able to, to give on to that. So right. that's, that's key. Yeah, I, I was fortunate in that. Um, I had, had uh, studied art when I was younger, uh, knew a lot of art history. And as someone who drew and painted a lot, um, I think that's one of the reasons if composition is any good, it finds its roots in that uh, education and artistic experience. And then my work in film and television, uh, I'm just comfortable directing large groups of people and using that experience to bring that into my photography. So my very varied uh, curriculum vitae has actually come in quite handy in my career as a photographer. Interesting. And the other interesting note about a, a photograph like this, um, you won't be able to make a photograph like this for, for many months, maybe, maybe until, until next, next spring, summer. Social distancing uh, is going to apply to models. Yeah, I've uh, I've had to cancel all of my work for March, April, and May for that very reason. I talked to some subjects that I was uh, hoping to travel to um, California and Washington State and some other American states who were interested in being part of group shoots. And now we're talking pop over, but we don't know for sure. So in the meantime, I'm editing and writing and working on the Nude in the Landscape book itself and cooking and baking. You just you make the best of the hand you're dealt, I think. Right, right. But I mean, look at the four uh, the four figures in the bottom of the tree. I mean, you know, a photo shoot. You're next to somebody for a while. Uh, by the way, I want to welcome uh, Vox Serene uh, to the uh, to the to the stream. Uh, Vox is a, a, a fabulous traveling model. Um, a, a goal of mine eventually is to photograph you next time you're here in New York City when uh, when everything is yeah when we're back to uh, some some form of shooting again in normal. Uh, the other aspect of, of this photo shoot, I want to just talk about your choosing to go with black and white and presenting in black and white. Your tattoo work was in color. Now we're seeing a lot of black and white. What's your thought process between making that, uh, besides making that choice? Um, the, the nude in the landscape was the next body of work that I embarked upon. Um, after uh, doing the tattoo project. And the tattoo project, I shot about 300 portraits of people against 90% of them was a gray seamless in a studio with two lights, the same light set up, the same bounces, hair and makeup. Um, it was, at, by the end of it, I wanted to do something that uh, creatively and, a, and as a photographer, I wanted to do something that was almost like the complete opposite, opposite of that outside ambient light, available light, um, landscapes, different locations. It, it, was, it was really uh, a, 
a specific attempt to try and do something as different as possible from the tattoo project. How do you uh, process this in post? Are you, uh, what black and white, what, how are you converting to black and white? Um, I'm converting in Photoshop and Lightroom. I sometimes use silver effects, but not as often as I used to. Yeah. Well, they're not, they're not developing it anymore. I, I lament, I lament my silver effects. It's gone yes. now, basically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, lovely photograph. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a door. It's a adorable. So, and I must confess in terms of doing my black and white conversions, I have spent many, many, many hours going through the YouTube tutorials on B and H, which is how I came across you through B the B and H tutorial. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. <laughs> it's uh, we're <laughs> just let's just give a quick B and H plug because B and H runs in my blood. I've, I've worked there for 22 years and I've instituted many programs there. It's a wonderful company to work for. Um, we are closed for Passover now, but it's. Uh, it's been a little bit rough. Um, B and H took some took some hits already, so yeah. uh, we're we're going to come back uh, a little leaner and meaner than we did going into this. But uh, we'll continue that. And and the the glory of B and H is that they gave me a soapbox so I could promote work and influence a guy like you uh, by showing other photographers. And so right on. We're all deeply appreciative. We'll keep it up. Tell us about this photograph. What's going on here? So how to make uh, your top ten. This is a, she is now a very well-known traveling um, fine art model. This is a Olivia Preston. And I think this is her second ever fine art nude shoot. And I think this is her, the first, she told me at the time that it was the first nude shoot that she'd ever done outside. So we were at the beach and my idea was to put her, to drape her along, along the top of this beautiful driftwood log. And Olivia looked and said, you know, Vince, if you cleaned out all the rocks and all the leaves, and if you promised, if you swore to me that there weren't any bugs or spiders in there, I think I might be able to fit in the middle of that log. Huh. So I spent 45 minutes uh, cleaning out the whole inside of that log where she has squeezed herself into, put down a beach towel, and... Mm it was like a light bulb went off. And I think that some of my strongest work from the Nude in the Landscape series are those images where the, the nude figure and the landscape, it's a little bit tough to tell where one begins and the other ends. It's kind of, uh, it's the synergy, it's the combination of the human figure and the landscape together that creates uh, really compelling images. And uh, I was, I was gobsmacked when I saw how these turned out. It, uh, it took the body of work in a completely new way. And, you know, it's like Emily saying, I think I could fit in there. Olivia saying, I could, I could get inside that log. Um, took the work in a completely new direction. So it's, uh, I, as always, I always say that I'm deeply appreciative of my muses because when I say, I always, I like to use the line, I can't do what I do without you. And it's literal in every sense of the word. You know, you, you mentioned muses and uh, I just want to, uh, we have to make lemonade out of the lemons that we get and being able to jump on Zoom uh, and use this, uh, this method to, to spread your word and show your work is, is really a godsend. But part of the Lempa mission uh, has been a relationship with the models and the muse. And uh, one of our missions, which we were trying to get to happen uh, when we did our, want to do our live conference, uh, and now I'm really enthusiastic, is to give the muses a voice. And uh, this has been a, a great presentation uh, and this has been a wonderful way of communicating. I look forward to uh, inviting uh, uh, Vox. Um, I've also uh, invited uh, uh, Rachel from uh, I Hate Blonde uh, and try to bring in some of these, uh, these muses and let them have a voice and speak to the photographers. Now, that being said, uh, Vince, I can obviously tell from the uh, loyalty that you have with your models and the relationships that you have with them and also know that you are, are truly are a solid guy. Um, that is critical. Uh, you, you said right off the bat, working with the model 
to create the photograph, a collaboration. And this is a, a very important part of, of how we want to advance this art form and how we want to take it and bring it to the next level of acceptability and responsibility. Can you give us a little bit of like how you, why do your models trust you and you can be unabashed? Um, I think it's in part because when um, I was starting out, I was a completely unknown entity. Um, but coming from a background in film and television, your talent, you can't do great work unless you have great talent uh, on camera. So I've always thought that um, the people in front of my lens were every bit as important as the people behind the lens. And as so as a screenwriter and a producer and a director, uh, I've, I've worked in terms of film and television, I've worked a lot of different jobs and I've even been an on-camera host myself. Um, I, I just, I, you know full well that it's not going to work unless you're getting the best out of the person who, who is your subject. And most of the models that I've worked with, um, you know, a lot of them go on to become very talented image, image creators themselves. I know a lot of models uh, who go on um, after a while, take up photography and their, and their images reflect the fact of their experience in front of the camera because they've been paying attention for a long time. And invariably they often make really great image makers themselves because they have that perspective of what it's like to be in front of the camera plus it's just about being a good person i think uh, as a photographer you always know a model who's who's good they turn yeah. i like to they turn on the minute you hold up the camera and you get everything ready they're yeah. they're in um, when you have to really coach uh, a novice that's like a different story um but uh you yeah no and Olivia, uh, I have made amazing photographs. I've never not had a great photo shoot with Olivia. She's an outstanding model. Okay, for uh, those of you that are, are uh, didn't know, you want to check out uh, hammingsonphotography.com and really, I think at this point, just uh, follow Vince on, on YouTube, I, 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 on Instagram. I love following you on Instagram, uh, seeing the work. I'm really looking forward to uh, when you start shooting again. Uh, because I, I think that you've got, uh, uh, I think you have a lot more to offer photography. And, and if I may, um, due to your uh, recently getting over the illness and plus the uh, what's going on in the world, uh, I have a, a mentor. He was the founder of Maine Workshops, uh, David, uh, David Lyman. And uh, David Lyman had uh, talked about uh, a uh, creativity working on a, uh, on a, on like a heartbeat scale. And, you got the best work when you went down into the negatives, into the depths, and you lost something or you had to uh, deal with something. And then as, as always, as things get better, you go up to the top and you keep going, the points of extreme go higher and lower each time. And once you accept the fact that, you know, as long as you, you can hit rock bottom, but you just need to go back up and make sure that you go higher than you were before, and you keep creating better and better work. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what what your work is going to look like in the the later part of uh, of 2020 and, and 2021. Me as well. <laughs> I've got. I have a lot of people going. Well, again, of course, it's a beautiful sunny day here in Vancouver. Like it's it's like it's a perfect day to go shooting. It's it's um, we live in interesting times. Uh, indeed, indeed, sure that isn't that a Chinese curse? <laughs> yes. Be careful what you wish for. So I just want to tell you guys real quickly about about Lempicon. Uh, Lempicon, um, the website uh, has a feature. It has an old school uh, forum on it, and you can post pictures. Uh, uh, you can post any pictures you want there and get critiques. And I would ask that uh, if you, as a photographer, if you ever want to get a critique on and have something, uh, a website that will accept it. Uh, please go to the forum. Uh, there's a, a great photographer, Matt Surratt, which I'm bummed out that he didn't make it. I know he reserved for it. I'll find out how he didn't get on the Zoom. Uh, Matt has been posting some very uh, 
challenging images that are, are pretty hardcore. Uh, and uh, it's interesting because that's what uh, fetish photography, fine art, nude, and uh, erotic photography is all about. And that's what our mission is. So um, we did it, uh, Vince. This was the inaugural, uh, inaugural launch of this uh, Zooming Lempicon uh, going uh, virtually. I uh, want to thank you greatly for coming. You missed a photograph. Did I? Yep. Hold, hold on. This is, uh, we, can, we can fix this. Did I miss a photograph? Hmm. So top 10 stories and it was uh, Cecilia, C nymph. Okay, hold on a second. We're gonna stop the screen share so you guys don't see me fumbling through my, <laughs> my MacBook. Um, hold on a second. C nymph, you know what? I do remember that photograph. Oh no, hold on a second. Let's get that one back. I made your life difficult because two of my best are also have two of the best stories. Okay, hold on. Vince Hemmingson, top 10 photos. And let me run down these. Oh, C Nymph is, uh, is the uh, Derrier up in, the, up in the air? Nope, she's on a log that's a uh, diagonal on the screen on the image. Oh, the, the, the image from, uh, okay, from your, uh, you discussed that in the beginning, right? Here, let's go to let's go to the share here so we can see this. I would remember speaking with Cecilia. Hold on, top ten, and let's share this, and then you can tell me. Oh, that made the uh, no. This is uh, top ten photos. Oh, these aren't the stories. Hold on, I'm sorry. All right, top ten stories. No, not that one. Yeah. Wait. Second row, first first photograph second row. This one? Nope. No. No. Second row. Back. This one. Okay, there we go. Okay. And hold on one second. Uh, go ahead, tell us about it. Um so Remember when I said that I always had very specific, I, I like to have a couple of very specific ideas when I go to a photo shoot? Well, I actually have my captain's papers for up to 100 tons. So I grew up around power boats and sailing boats. And um, you would think with someone who's had that much experience on the sea, that when they were going to the beach specifically to shoot with the tide out, that you would check the tide charts so i went to the beach expecting the tide all the way to, to to be out and the tide was all the way in and i had actually spent back in the day when you could get your digital uh cameras your sensor converted so that it shot infrared so cecilia and i actually went to the beach specifically to shoot infrared photographs because this tide was supposed to be all the way out and it was going to be this amazing black sand and a black and Cecilia. And when I got there, there was almost no room to stand on the beach because the tide was so far in. And uh, I actually kind of had a bit of a meltdown. And I, as I was having a temper tantrum on the beach, uh, Cecilia Wilmer, who's an amazing photo uh, model, um, she turned to me and she said, you know, Vince, you have a beautiful woman who's willing to be naked in front of your camera all day. She goes, I think we can get something. And that day we went out and got a whole series of amazing images. And uh, this image was actually picked in a juried exhibition um, for the body collection and uh, hung an exhibition at the visitor's gallery at the Musée de Louvre. Um, back in 2015. So this image, it's probably for the longest time the image that I was, the image that I was most well known for, um, that won me a bunch of awards. And it was this image that I, after, after I processed it and printed it, that was the first time that I knew for sure that I had a book, that I could create a body of work 
that would make a good book. And I was really lucky to work with Cecilia. Um, and I met her in Greg Gorman's workshop and we enjoyed working and she called me up out of the blue and said, would you be interested in photographing me and my boyfriend? And I said, yes, of course. I said, but I just bought a new D3S and I just went to Gorman's workshop. So I've spent about $10,000 on my photography addiction this month. Can I get a rain check? And she burst out laughing and she goes, oh, I, I was worried that I was gonna have to pay you. So we just started working together and it was an amazing collaboration. And I have always thought that Cecilia was kind of like my master's thesis in fine art nudes because I was able to shoot her probably four times. And I couldn't book her because she's a working agency model. So, but when she would have a day or an afternoon off, she would call me up and say, would you like to, do you have time to do a photo shoot? And whenever possible, I would arrange my calendar because I learned so much working with a model who had so much experience. She made me a much It's hard not to get great images of uh, someone who's that talented. Yeah. Um, we took, um, you, you photograph uh, women um, of varying sizes and I, you know, what just drew me to it was just following the line, the shape, and of course the, the ribs, meaning a uh, a thin model. Um, any uh, any wisdom you can share with with working with different body types, and giving confidence to to anyone who graces your lens. Yeah, um, you know that's that's really, again, um, I had a lot of life drawing classes as a. Uh, as an art student and, and then and I've always appreciated flesh like I'm a big Lucian Freud fan um, you know if you look at painters flesh is interesting flesh is interesting to to paint and so you know you mentioned Robert Maplethorpe and certainly uh, Irving Penn has been a huge influence on me I own every book that Irving Penn ever ever published in first editions whenever I can find them. And uh, he did a book called Earthly Bodies. And it's just beautiful work of, of, the, of the physical form that, that's voluptuous, that has roles. And um, I think that a lot of fine art photographers get caught up in the idea of shooting models who are, you know, 20 to 25. And, and um, I think you lose an opportunity to illustrate more of the human condition and have more variety and more visually like, I mean, this summer I, uh, I was able to shoot um, two models, Judy and Sarah, who are 77 and 78, and it's one of my all-time favorite photo shoots um, because their their bodies are just they you know they just their maps of their life's journey they just tell the story and um, it's it I I find it a little bit disturbing about what it says about us culturally that if art is supposed to illustrate our greatest ideals. Um, and the things that we hold as, you know, the virtues of our civilization, that we see so few fine art nudes of women past the age of, of older women, period, never mind past the age of menopause, or of different body sizes and shapes and forms. It seems to me to actually be quite blind. And increasingly, when you speak to artists of color, um, and artists of other minorities. I mean, the, we have to face the fact that museums is populated by a lot of art that's dominated by dead white guys. And it's not really a very great mirror of what our culture or, or our society looks like. And I think as artists, we have a responsibility to widen the scope and focus of our representations.